Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I am your co-host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneider, and Rutgers beat writer, Craig Epstein. Guys, this is one that uh, I'm sure you guys, whoever wrote the story for, for the Rutgers Rival site, had the story basically done and then had to do a, a heavy revision of it because Rutgers made its largest comeback in basketball since 1996. Rutgers won on the road against Penn State after being down by 19 points in the second half. They won 59 to 56 on the back of a freshman superhero moment from Derek Simpson. Guys, I don't really know how this game turned out the way it did. Let's just talk about it. Uh, let's just do the same thing we did last time. First first thing that came to your mind from that game, and then we'll get deeper into it. Richie, what'd you, first thing that comes to your mind about this game from last night? <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't even know. That first half was just something that was that was ugly that, that was brutal i i started writing the loss i was like yeah here we go i'm just gonna fill in the stats at this point and uh second half i was like you know down 19 i'm like wow i can really just sit back and just wait now at this point uh i think there's 16 minutes left and they're down 19 and then all of a sudden i'm like can they do this oh you know what they got it down to single digits oh no yeah. oh holy shit they tied it oh my god they took yeah. the lead. <laughs> like what the fuck <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I don't know really how to react other than that. It was I- incredible. And um, shout out to Derek Simpson. That man is a uh, he's a killer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, going it, so going into this game, I figured it was going to go one of two ways. Either Rutgers was going to win a, a close one or they were going to get run out of the gym. Now, I didn't expect both to happen in the same game. So that kind of... <laughs> That, that kind of threw me off a little bit. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest. I did think the game was over early. I was like, wow, they're just, they just looked awful. You know, in that first half, I mean, prior to Sem- Derek Simpson scoring, you know, seven straight points and going into the half downtown. But even then, I mean, going at that, at that point, it felt like going down, blue, trailing by 10 almost felt like trailing by like 30, you know? It's just yeah, like, yep. you know, I mean, yeah, they showed, a, they, they showed a little bit of life, but he was literally the only person that showed like really any pulse in that first half so i was just like whatever i was like at this point just just give it to simpson let him shoot for the rest of the second half and just see where the chips fall but then i mean as the game went on they kind of just kept sticking around sticking around and you know i maybe i think i really didn't i'll be honest i don't think i really bought into it until they cut it i think spencer made it a three-point game with his free throws and i was like okay i'm like well, i was like wow they could i mean they could really do this and then Simpson has the big, you know, three point play that puts him ahead. And I'm like, then this is, it's like, wow. It's like, it, it's just, you just can't believe what you're watching. Cause it's like, how is this the same team from that first step to the second half? It's just unbelievable. And then Cliff with the big uh, putback puts him up by three. And then that was, that was it. I mean, credit to Rutgers that the last defensive stand was tremendous. I mean, Spencer just kind of swatting it, his hand down at the, per- at the perfect moment to, to knock it away and Rutgers gets the win. And honestly, like it wasn't, like we said, it wasn't pretty. It, it's not something you're going to, you know, you're going to give to your girlfriend, but I mean, it was, it was a, it was, it was a gutsy win. It was a real gutsy <laughs> win. And I, like I said, like I said, uh, like I said in the last pod, I think one, I think this win likely puts them into the tournament, beat Minnesota and you're 100% block. It's in, you're done. But I do think this win likely puts them into the tournament. Don't give yeah. it to your girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, I, I, a hell of an analogy. I, thank you. I, I think the, the story of this game for sure is Derek Simpson. It's probably going to be known as the Derek Simpson game amongst Rutgers fans. This is a guy who all season, he's shown flashes <clears> of <throat> the ability to do stuff like this, the ability to kind of create his own shot. To, he hasn't probably, he's got one of the best uh, first steps in the Big Ten period, but he's definitely the, got the most burst on Rutgers' all, uh, entire roster. Uh, and he was the guy who they needed this game. Like they need somebody to step up and, and be a more of a, you know, a go-to score for them. Like they've got a few guys who here and there can do it, but Derek Simpson is a guy we're going to need for the rest of the season. He had nine of the Rutgers last 11 points in the first half to close out the first half. That was huge momentum wise building into the second half, even though, you know, <laughs> we went into the half down 10 and within three minutes of the second half, we're down 19 but still, like there was, there was fight in this team. They never gave up, and that's credit to Pykel. Like as annoying as it can be at the end of some games when we're down nine with forty-five seconds left and they're still fouling, like this is a team that never gives up. 
And this is kind of proof of the pudding. Like, if you don't give up, occasionally you're going to steal some games. And this is an, an example of that. This is a quad one win for Rutgers. This is their sixth quad one win of the season, their fourth quad one road win. So I think the narrative of Rutgers can't win on the road is officially dead because I don't know if there's a single team in the country who has four plus quad one road wins. And I don't know that to be true, but that is such a huge feather in the cap of Pike constantly evolving this program into something that it previously wasn't. I think the next evolution will be uh, something that's coherent on offense because until we had that that chest middle play that they kept calling over and over in the second half, we didn't really have any repeatable offense. And I know this is something Danny Breslauer talks about all the time is like, we need repeatable go-to offense. And that like, that weird like tri-weave high pick and roll that they're running with Derek Simpson was working over and over and they just kept going to it. And that the only other kind of repeatable offense we had all season prior to that was that Paul Cliff high pick and roll action that teams figured out and they've, really kind of stifled that the rest of the season. So I'm just very impressed with, with Derek Simpson. This is something that we need more of moving forward. But I do want to talk about just how good this defense was in the second half as well, because Rutgers totally turned this game on ahead once they figured something out on defense. What do you guys think that was on defense that they just uh, kind of had snap I mean, into place? Stop Jalen Pickett. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Cameron, Cameron Winter obviously had a pretty good game too, but Jalen Pickett had 11 of the, led the team with 11 points for Penn State in the first half. And then the second half, he attempted zero shots. Like, you shut him down, you shut down that entire Penn State team. He, he is, I don't want to say he's an All-American, but he's pretty damn close to it. Uh, he has had a phenomenal year, and... All he you is, had to do was shut him down. First team, he's second team All American. He's yeah, he's, he's he's an All American level player. Yeah, he's he was great this year, and um, you you let other guys shoot the ball, and that's kind of what happens. Penn State lives and dies by that three pointer, and Seth Lundy went one of twelve in the second half, one of sixteen overall, zero of seven from three. Like let other guys shoot, just stop Lund, stop pick it, and let anyone else go off or try to let them go off, and it's not going to happen for them. That's just basically been the the Penn State's mo this entire season. So they shut him down, and that that was kind of it. Like game over, pretty much. Um, credit to everybody on that. Was, was a whole like team effort there because Simpson was guarding him at some times. There was McConnell guarding him, obviously. Uh, I think even Spencer was guarding him at times too. And that's just that was it. You shut. I can't. I can't say it enough. Shut him down, and you win the game. I think it's understated how crazy that is. So Seth Lundy is a forty-two percent three or three-point shooter on the season on high volume. We held mm-hmm. him 0 for 11 from three. Yeah, that's right. First game, I think he went one for five from three. Yeah, so and then Andrew, totally Andrew, shut him down. Andrew Funk goes one of seven. Like that's one of their their second best three point shooter or third best three point shooter, whatever he is. It's top three, I know that. But uh, and you just you shut them down, and they, they uh, like like Craig said, I didn't expect them to live and die. I expected them either to live or die by that three point line, but they did both in the same games. So it's like <laughs> it's incredible. Um. Yeah, that's kind of all, that's all I got. I mean, they shot what thirty something percent in the, or forty something percent from three in the first half, and then they shot twenty seven percent overall. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, so to me, I don't want to take it. I don't want to feel like I'm taking anything away from Rutgers defense. I thought they played an awesome game, but I do feel like when there's a there's a nineteen point second half comeback, I think it's a little bit of both of Rutgers winning it and Penn State losing it because I mean, Penn State did miss what, 14 straight field goals at the end of the game. They didn't score a field goal for the last 916. I can't imagine every one of those, you know, was Rutgers defense. I ima- I would imagine at least some of them were just, like, good looks that they just didn't go in. So, again, but, I mean, it's just it's just crazy that, yeah, that they could be – It's just, you know what it is? And I was watching in the first half. It kind of reminded me a little bit of with the Jets defense this season where it's like, the Jets defense this season. Your analogies uh, today. Yeah, I know. Yeah, let's see how you land this plane. Go ahead. So the Jets defense. <laughs> season, the Jets defense this season was solid, but their offense was just so bad that like they're that you go into the like mentally you're going into the game knowing you have to like keep them at a certain score. So because otherwise you're not going to win. So it's like, I think just from a mental standpoint, you could, I think feel like you could see it in that first half where their offense was just so bad that it just kind of wore down the defense, like, physically and mentally, where it was like they were just letting kind of just these easy kind of plays go by. And it's just like, I don't know. I feel like their offense was affecting their defense big time in the first half. But then once the second half came and the offense at least pieced together, like, a semblance of, you know, of consistency, 
And then what do you know? Rutgers comes back and the defense does its thing and they come back and win. So to me, it's like the defense picks up the offense. The offense picks up the defense as long as, and I think we said it early in the season, as long as Rutgers hits like six, like 60, 70 points, they're probably going to win just because their defense is so, has been so solid. So I'm again, 50, 59 points isn't like the sexiest number in the world, but I mean, it got the job done against Penn State. 10 so points again, off. as long as you, what was that? 10 points off from that sexy number you're talking about. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe against Minnesota. But, uh, but no, you get to, you get to that mid, mid 60s, upper seven, get into the 70s. Rutgers is probably going to win just because the defense, defense is good. I'll be honest. I had a, I had a tweet ready um, in the first half. I was like, oh, I'm going to wait till the game's over. That fucking speed limit sign. I was like, just, just delete it. There's still time to delete this tweet. Like, if you, <laughs> you don't. What if you had another team under what 65 and then lose? It's like, no, delete the tweet. Like, it's it's over. But hey, they pulled it out again. And uh, what are they? 18 two now, 18 three, something like that. Whatever it is. Um, when they when opponents score under 65 this season. But uh, yeah, no, you you kind of. I don't know where you're going with that Jets thing, but uh, <laughs> but uh. Seemed- I nailed it, right? You know, it seems oh, yeah. like the, the the offense picks up the defense, defense picks up the offense. It's all it's to me. It's a mental game. It's like I, I mean, you see, you ever see a Tom Hanks movie where you got the plane almost crashes and you, you kind of land totally. it safely? Yeah, you totally. land it safely at the end, totally. but it was like you, know, you, had, you had a moment there where it was like, ooh. Mm. It's it. Well, I guess it's a jet in this case. <sighs> yeah, every take has some turbulence until you can fully express what you're trying what you're trying to talk about. But I, I see what you're talking about though, because. Rutgers, they could be down four, and it feels insurmountable because the offense has just so consistently let them they, – they've been consistently inconsistent, I guess is the best way to, to talk about it, is just you can't really rely on that. Unless you have – you want to hold a lead the entire game to feel safe with, with how Rutgers' offense has been playing. But this truly was just like a tale of two halves because – Yeah. Like if you look at – uh, Greg Stewart, so G Stewart twenty one posted this on Twitter, and I, I think it's just a crazy juxtaposition of stats. So when Pike called the timeout with seventeen oh two left in the second half, when Penn State took their nineteen point lead, after that timeout, Penn State went three of twenty two from the field, so that's thirteen point six percent. They went two of thirteen from three, and they committed seven turnovers. Before that, they shot 17 of 32 from the field. So that's 53%. They shot uh, from three. They shot six of 16. So that's like 45% or 40-ish percent from three. And Rutgers just totally changed on offense too. Rutgers, from that point forward, they shot 13 of 25 from the field, four of seven from three, and didn't commit a single turnover in the final 17.02 of the game. That is insane. That is two entirely different games. I don't know what Pike said to the team during that timeout, but whatever it was, we got to bottle that shit up and fucking use it the rest of the season. Obviously, they cha- they started calling whatever that chess middle was pl- play was for most of the second half. But I-, I cannot believe how much that game turned on its head. Like at one point, Penn State, uh, at this point, exactly, Penn State had a 97.8% chance in terms of ESPN's win probability to win. Yeah. Eric Shapiro Insane. tweeted out the uh, the video. They ran it for like f- five straight baskets. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's it's like a weave chin ball screen, he called yep. it. Um, yeah, it's, that's pretty much what it is. But that that's what their chess middle was. And it just, it worked to perfection every single time. And this this like great screens by Cliff, like multiple screens on yep. one play. And then great, you got to give Wolfolk a little credit too. He's, he was sent from pretty powerful screens as well. Um, yeah, and, this... and Derek Simpson thanked. It was I, I don't know who asked the question during the press conference after the game, but somebody asked, you know, basically like, how do you feel after this game? Like, this is the best game of your career. You set career highs in points. Like, the team really needed you. And he didn't talk about himself. He talked about thanking Wolfolk and thanking Cliff for all the, the great screens they set to get him open on those shots mm-hmm. and give him those opportunities. So he's a very mature kid. Yeah, and I, I feel like we're not talking about an unsung hero here, but uh, Palmquist. Two, like two yeah. three pointers, clutch, like late in the game, like that was huge. If you can get him going and him shooting from three, tournament run back on. I'll say. <laughs> so, the only problem, I was yeah, gonna say the only problem. So, uh, yes, that like I said, I think this win likely puts in the tournament, but it wasn't a magic elixir for everything. Because to me, once again, Paul just had a really bad game. 
Cliff is still Let's struggling. Let's keep on the positive train for right okay. now. Okay. Yeah, this on. was we'll, a crazy we'll, we'll, one. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to the negatives. Okay. What were you going to say, Mike? I think Palmquist, I don't know if it was just getting on the court and hitting smoking threes and that put that confidence back in him. But he is a totally different player than he was. Like, do you remember him playing in the early season when he was he was in the mop-up unit and against teams like you know, Ryder <laughs> and against those like really bad like quad four level teams? He didn't look like he could handle a basketball. Like he was throwing passes high, like almost out of bounds. He just didn't even look like he could like it looked like he was a guy who was a freshman who they're trying to train how to play basketball. And he's had a hell of a transformation since it was the, I think, the um, the Ohio State game where his parents were in town and he was starting to get minutes mm-hmm. again. This is a totally different player. He's got confidence. And even on defense, he's like he's a usable defensive player. He doesn't make dumb mistakes. He walls up guys well. He's not like a shutdown defender, but he is a, he's evolved into a very useful player, both offensively and defensively. Like, if you hit him in the corner, he's probably got a 50% chance of hitting that three. Like, yeah. I'm very impressed with how he's evolved as a player and how he's matured this year. If you watch yeah. it on, on all these like weave uh these weave ball screens, like he's just spotted up in the corner like this, yep. ready to go, like right away. And it's just I, I feel like his release is a little slow. And that might affect like when guards are gonna go on him, but he I mean he hits, so who cares? He's got like, a smooth stroke too. He's not yeah. it's it's all it's all net when he's hitting it. He hit one from the yeah. top of the key yesterday too. Like mm-hmm. I'm really, really proud of this kid. Yeah, that, it's not talked about enough. He he had a hell of a game. Yeah, I just he hit. I feel like he hits one or two clutch threes a game. Honestly, that yeah, the could, last like six, seven, eight games. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, who else? I, I thought you know defensively. I thought Cliff played really well. Um, there was I think towards the end of the game, our our guys might have gotten worn out a bit <clears> because <throat> we were letting a lot of offensive rebounds. Um, I don't think Penn State had like a single offensive rebound for like the first. I don't know if it was the first half, but. Remember looking at the stats and Rutgers had like four offensive rebounds and Penn State had none. Yeah, at some they point. had none in the first half. They had none in the first half. Yep, all nine okay, came so in the second. Yeah, so they had nine second half offensive rebounds. Which <clears throat> a team like Penn State, that's kind of one of the the, the features of a high uh, outside shooting team. Or a lot of three pointers, they'll bounce really far back into the backcourt. So that's why you can get a lot more offensive rebounds. But yeah, that's got to get cleaned up. I think we were a little sloppy there, but for the most part, you know, Cliff had 13 rebounds tonight, nine or last night, nine points. He only had two fouls the whole game. He was able to stay on the court for 32 minutes, and they needed him for those 32 minutes. Probably were, even more if they could have gotten him. Were both fouls over the back, or was it just the one? I think the one were, right? I thought was really questionable because he just jumped straight in the air, didn't make contact, yeah. and tipped it back. I didn't think the one was a foul, but. I think they both were offensive fouls, yeah. Yeah, that's that's where it was a little rough. There's a couple offensive fouls that were just stupid, like stupid things. I think Caleb yeah. got called for one. I think Paul got called for one. Paul got all five thousand in the second half, which is crazy to say. Like <laughs> that was impressive in a I've, bad way. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've, never, I've never seen that. Like that's something I used to do in like CYO. Like, oh, yeah, Rich, Rich, go out there and just go piss them off. Okay, right. Rich, you're out of the game. Like you were in for two minutes. What happened? Like I don't know. <laughs> uh, he said, piss him off, not me. Yeah, another uh, sneaky thing about Simpson last night. He had six rebounds. Like he, uh, yeah, wow. Well, I didn't see that. Second Cam, on the had, Cam had six rebounds, too. Like the, the rebounding wasn't all Cliff. Like The guys just overall did pretty good. I think the biggest thing about Simpson yesterday was, was probably the first time, or maybe maybe the Indian game, too, where I felt like comfortable with him running the offense, where... It's always been yeah. Paul kind of running, being the engine for the offense. But yesterday, obviously, Paul didn't have a great game. And Derek Simpson did have a great game. So it was just like this felt like the first time where I was like, okay, give the ball to Simpson and let him be the one to run the show. Because at this, to me, it was just like that was, that was his game yesterday. Well, they're different, completely different point guards. Yeah. Like, yeah. obviously, the speed factor and athleticism factor is there for Simpson. It's not as much there for Mulcahy. I'd argue Mulcahy has a lot better vision. Whereas Simpson's starting to learn a little bit how to be a point guard. He's more of a scoring point guard, whereas Paul's yep. a distributor. So it, it's a completely different offense when Simpson's out there. And I I don't know. Do you what now my question to you guys is I think I, I have my own thoughts on this and I'll dive into it, but is Simpson start over Mulcahy going forward? No. Let me just put that out there. I don't think so. Yeah. But I do think Simpson has earned way more minutes than he's gotten in the last, you know. 
dozen games. I think he's probably going to play 25 to 30 minutes a game moving forward. And he got 28 last night, and that's basically because he was on fire. I do think that he becomes like the Hyatt off the bench that we previously had, where Hyatt was basically like a sixth starter in terms of minutes. But I, I think Simpson has earned way more minutes. I don't think you could sit Paul because I think Paul's a very like he's very he's, he rides high as high and he rides low as low. You bench Paul, he's you can't get him back this season. So I think you need to keep playing yeah. Paul, keep getting his confidence back because I mean you look. We, I guess we could kind of start talking about some negatives now. Paul, man, uh, zero points last night on 0 for 6 shooting, 5,000 in the second half. This is the third game in the last five that he's fouled out of. And I think he's fouling out in frustration because of frustration. Yeah, he's not, things aren't going well for him offensively. He's committing a lot of turnovers. And that just bleeds over a lot of dumb fouls. Like, how do you, I just don't know how you foul five times in like the span of what? 18 minutes in the second half because he, he fouled out late in the the, the second um, half. But yeah, I don't know, man. Ten he minutes played three in the second what, half. What, he pick up three and how quickly? Got so five thousand ten minutes. Yeah, five thousand ten minutes. <sighs> man, yeah, that's I don't know. I, yeah, I don't want no, to go had to negative, later than that. Like, he, he had that one. He's got to play late in the second half. It says ten. Uh, it says he only played ten minutes on the box score. Well, because he picked up three quick ones and then he sat for like most of yeah. He a played while, eight, eighteen in the, back in eighteen in the first and ten minutes in the second. Yeah. No, wow. his last foul was with with one one thirty left. No, I'm saying he played with ten minutes. No, he only he, played he 10 got minutes his total. fifth. Okay, so he only played yeah, ten not, minutes. Not, yeah, ten minutes total in the second half. Yeah, that's 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 like a foul for every two minutes. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's not that's not a good look. And then like if you notice, I feel like. And it, it kind of leads to what you were just saying. Like, once he does one bad thing, it's just a trickle down effect. And it's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like, like so he missed a layup. And then he was like, oh, the next one, he missed a second layup. And it's like, all right, well, this isn't going to go good now. And so then this is a perfect just, example oh. of that, too, because that there was a play late in the fourth, in the second half. There was like a minute 30 left where Paul's dribbling. He's got like seven seconds. He's dribbling, dribbling, dribbling. And he goes <clears> for like this runner from the foul line and he gets blocked by Seth Lundy. Seth Lundy picks up the ball, starts dribbling up court, foul, Paul fouls him immediately. That's his fifth foul. So he's compounding mistakes with more mistakes. Um, I, I don't know. I don't. Paul, you kind of just like have to let play out of these funks. But we're so late in the season now, I just don't know how you can get him to play out of this. Yeah, to me, I guess going back to what you talked about, I mean, yeah, they're not they're not benching Paul to me. I think <clears> he's still going to start, and Simpson's going to be that spark plug off the bench that this team – Really needs. I mean, he's, I mean, we talk about Pot after Pot that they basically have no bench, but mm-hmm. Simpson can be, you know, that the, <laughs> that piece of that fire that can, you know, hopefully jumpstart something. But um, honestly, though, in the long run, I think Derek Simpson's style of play is probably if you're going to make any type of like run or anything in March, it would be off of probably Derek Simpson's style of play because he's just so fast. He's got that quick burst. He's hard to guard when he starts going. So to me, you see, it, I feel like you see it every year in March. Is that like? Guard play is pretty much what wins you in the tournament, and his style, that that just speed style, is what would probably carry them in the long run if they were to make any type of run. It's nothing against nothing against like Paul or his style of play. It's just it's just different. It's more slow. It's more methodical. It breaks you down, which can win you games in the Big Ten. I mean, as we've seen now over how many years now, so you'll win games in the Big Ten with that style. But in but once you get to once you get to March and you face teams that have, you know, really speedy guards, you know, Paul has a tough time guarding those guys. And Derek Simpson could be the type of guy that maybe puts you on his back. And if he keeps, if he builds off of a performance like this, he keeps building and building and building. That could be the type of style that could, that could carry you and get you at least maybe a couple wins in uh, the, in the, in the tournament. Yeah. It depends on matchup, obviously, but like, yeah, I've been watching a lot of big East basketball and it's just, it's all speed with the guards. Like it's, it's yeah. kind of completely, I know everyone says it, but it's just like, you notice it more when you watch it more. And it's just, there's just such a totally different game. The big 10 has to adapt a little bit. Like it, it drives me a little nuts. I know you have to have a big bully, big man now in the big 10 to compete, but you also have to adapt to the new age of basketball. Like it's, it's kind of crazy. That's why I feel like I, they're not going to make it now probably, but if Penn state was somehow to make it into that tournament, I feel like they could have made a little run. Like they're like, a typical Big East team. They don't have a big man, a couple guards, a lot of shooters. Like that's 
it's what basketball is kind of nowadays. Yeah. And I was going to ask you about this, Richie. I mean, I, maybe I'm a little bit of a maso- was masochist, but so obviously you're the Penn State. SAT uh, word. You run the Penn State board. What was the feeling from uh, the Penn State side after a game like this? I mean, they definitely weren't happy. Um, it's more <laughs> of like, they're not shocked either. Like I saw a couple comments on Twitter and the message board saying like, hey, like, it's not sh- shocked, not super surprised though. And it's like, yeah, like this, they, they don't give a shit about basketball to be honest. It's, Right yep. now, it's all wrestling for them, and that's their main sport this winter season. And then they're they're big into lacrosse too, just like Rutgers is. Um, not as good as Rutgers is this year, I think, or the year before, or even recently, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's all football and wrestling there. They they don't really. They're like, yep, yeah, well, here we go again, another another down year for hoops. Like a lot of people, I saw comments saying Pat Chambers is better than uh, Micah Shrewsbury. Um, I even saw like Rutgers comments saying like on our board saying like, hey, like. Mike Shrewsbury stinks. Like he's awful. Like I don't know, he got out coached. I'm like, no, number one, no shit. He got out coached. Like Steve Peichel is, is is a better coach than Mike Shrewsbury. I think that's pretty well known at this point. Number two, like you got to give the guy some credit. He he's taking a shit program and kind of is slowly doing what Peichel did with Rutgers. Like they're more competitive than they were before uh, Shrewsbury got there, in my opinion. They haven't made the tournament since what 2015, 2016. Like I, I, I don't. Honest, that, I think he's a good the, coach. I don't think yeah. he's a bad coach at all. It's just, I think that, what do they have, the ball with 14 and a half seconds left at that on the last position? Like, to me, it was, it was that was bad. To me, it's like, it, it, honestly, it almost reminded, that last possession almost reminded me a little bit of the, was it the Ohio State, Penn, was the Penn State game, right? Well, yeah, just, did you see what Chris sent us? Is that what you're uh, saying? Oh, no, what did he say? Okay, here, I'm going to, I'm just going to pop it up in this window real quick. See, this is me and Chris, you know, well, then, two peas in a pot. Look at that time. bad boy right there. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. I did see that, yeah. <laughs> I did see that. Look at that. End. Well, yeah. in fairness, there was no referee around, and there was nobody, no referee looking at the play. How could no, they have possibly no. seen that? How could this yeah. guy? Well, <laughs> in his defense, he is wearing a white shoe, and there is a, it is a white line, so it can easily be mixed up. I you can't know? zoom in. If I could zoom in, I'd show you. <laughs> yeah. You do this. Yeah. That's about all Not- I can do. I don't know. I don't think it's on. I think it's off the line. <laughs> <laughs> this is oh I'm, I forgot this is soccer. It does, if the ball's not over the line, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just I guess going back to what I was saying, it was 14 and a half seconds left. It just felt like they were shooting threes no matter what. Like they even said on the broadcast, they were like, if you get by, if you get by Rutgers defense, they're going to give you the layup. Like because they're not, they don't want to foul. And Rutgers, yeah. as they have shown, I mean, if you foul the right guy, they they're probably not making it. And as we saw in the Ohio State game, I mean, they're not exactly in the crunch in the crunchest of crunch times. Are uh, the greatest free throw shooting team in the world? So it's like I don't know. Almost I just think it's in the I just, last night too. Same exact yeah, scenario. I, exactly. Yep. Well, yep. Hear, hear me out. If this is the the question of all questions in terms of basketball late game up three, do you foul? Or do you not so, foul? Or do you give them five think, possessions no, no. to shoot a three? <laughs> so here's the thing with how you do it. It's got to be like playing blackjack. You got to play the numbers. You got to play the same strategy every time. You can't. You can't just like because I doubled uh, with ten and I got a fourteen. The dealer showing a six, mm-hmm. and the dealer ended up getting a twenty. Like you don't like not go back to that strategy the next time. If you have a strategy, you go with it. You stick with it every time. Each time. Yeah. So I think Pike felt like he got burned in the Ohio State game doing it, so he stopped doing it. Last night mm-hmm. worked out. If you saw the the Michigan Wisconsin game, that was the most clear example of why you should do that with the yeah. Hunter Dickinson three. You foul him, you know, thirty <clears> feet <throat> away from the basket with point four seconds left. They mm-hmm. can't win. It's very very hard yeah. to win in that scenario. That sixty percent free throw shooting. It's like you know what? Maybe I just they might not even make one. Like I'll take yeah. my chances. Yep. Yeah, to me, um, I think once we and Mike were talking about this, I think the magic number to me is like once you hit that five second mark, like you're foul. Like the, yep. the, to me, that's no matter what the, the what the situation is. Once you get five seconds or left, you should be fouling because there's almost almost no way that a team's going to come back from that. But I mean, to me, uh, that was not a point yesterday with, with where Rutgers was going to foul no. mainly because Penn State. I mean, Penn State was going to shoot a three. Like that, no matter what, Penn State was shooting three. So and you're not going to foul a three-point shooter because, you know, you foul three free throws or God forbid the ball goes in, you lose the game. So, yeah, I mean, there are situations where I think you do foul, uh, but yesterday was not one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I also think credit to Cam on that last possession too because the ball was getting kicked around like a fucking pinball. Uh, They had a a couple nice looks, and I think it was Lundy spotting up 
for that final look. And Cam played excellent defense. He waited for the exact moment. And then, like we talked about this before with the pod, he struck like a fucking viper. As soon as that ball started going into the pocket of of, uh, of Lundy, he just swatted it away. And you saw Shrewsbury juxtaposed right behind him. And he goes from like this like look of excitement to just like putting his head down. You knew it was, it was over at that point. Uh, but they just really played that last possession really well. And this is the thing Rutgers has done well all season where they, they've, they've, how many games have they won playing great defense on the last possession? I'm thinking the Wisconsin game recently, this game recently. Uh, I think they played the Ohio State game the second time, great defensive stand at the end. It's just like over and over, they, they find a way to win these these games on the last possession. Yeah, I, I don't know what else to say there. That's I think I've said everything I could about this game. Craig, if you got anything else. Mm, I think that's just about it. I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, I think, mm-hmm. I think it's just about it. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for my rant whenever you guys are ready. <laughs> uh, I don't know what this rant's going to be about. But, oh, you um... know. You know what it's about, baby. It's about the recruiting rankings. All right. Let's, 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 ta- let's talk about it. All right, Jerry, I get it. You hate you hate recruiting rankings. You hate this. You hate that. Whatever. You, ha- you, you trust one guy and one guy only, right, in the recruiting rankings? He said he trusts Jay Gomes and Ben Jay Hoops. Who has a say in the rivals' recruiting rankings? Let's not act like Derek Simpson was underrated by any means. He was the number 44 point guard by us. I'll, I'll even use the other ones as a comparison. Number 40 point guard by 247. Number 43 point guard by ESPN. Like, it's not like he was underrated whatsoever at all. And the one guy that you do apparently trust with the recruiting rankings was Jay Gomes, who has a say in the rivals' recruiting rankings. Derek Simpson was properly rated. He was a three-star He's not a four-star, no offense to him. He's he's a little smaller than most of the point guards in the four-star rankings. The four-stars only go to, what, 120, 125? Like, yeah. I, I, I love Derek. I think he's been great. He's not a hundred top 125 recruit in his class. Like, that's just a fact. Like, so I, I think he his, has potential, but. If his height and weight is correct from his high school recruiting profile, at 6'1", 165, there's not many kids who are – that size who are top 150 recruits because yeah. rivals ranks based on the projection to the next level. Let's not forget that. So these, even guys who, you know, go to Kentucky, they score two points a game and then they leave after their freshman season and their lottery picks somehow it's because they have projectable NBA bodies and they have skills that project in the NBA. It's re- how many guards in the NBA are six, one, I'll wait because it's not many. <laughs> it's Any. it's a handful. And Derek Simpson has elite qualities. Like he has leap burst. He has the ability to make shot that create his own shot. And I think he he will develop as a better finisher as he gets stronger in college basketball. But this is a kid who I don't know if he's legitimately six one. He might be taller than that. I think he is a little taller than that. But it's not like he had a ton of offers. His best offer outside of Rutgers was Arizona State. And it's a bunch of group of five schools after that. So I, I think when you understand the methodology that goes into rankings, the ranking made sense. And it's not like he was playing a bunch of big showcase stuff. As as we've known about his recruitment, he had the same AAU team his entire high school career. He got played for the same, not necessarily a talent hotbed of a high school in Lenape. So he was a kid who was a bit under the radar on the national scene because he had he gone to these big showcase events, maybe he would have, you know, raised his recruiting ranking up, but who knows? I, I think it's, it's tough to know. It was a great job by Pike getting him wrapped up early. It was a great, he's a great talent evaluator. So I, I think anybody Pike lands is probably underrated outside of, you know, maybe Ace Bailey or you know, I mean, <laughs> Gavin, Gavin, Gra- Gavin Griffiths. Yeah. I mean, Ben Dongu, even Ben Dongu might be underrated to be honest, but. Yeah, no, I just I, I need to throw it out there. Like you can you can hate on the recruiting rankings all you want, but that that one I think it's pretty accurate. Like he's a top forty point guard. Like who's above him? Like there's some big names above him. Like not yep. like he was ranked like four hundred and fifty or whatever uh, or five hundred whatever Geo was in the rankings. Like he was he was ranked pretty high for a point guard. Like I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there. No bad blood between me and Jerry. It's just I need to throw. That recruiting rankings are legit, and they mean na- more now than ever with NIL and all that. Like I talked to a, a high school agent, which it's fucking weird to say, 
in the first place. <laughs> and he's like, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, like I got a couple kids. Like I'll tell you right now, people can complain about recruiting rankings, but these things mean more than ever. This is how they're determining who gets paid what. Like, yeah. So, I mean, r- rankings mean stars matter at the end of the day. And y- you see it in terms of talent too. And I, we even saw like one of our resident like board experts in, ter- in terms of hoops say it the other day too, after the Michigan loss. Like uh, the RU, RU 72 guy. He said something about how like rankings matter. Like that's why that Michigan team, like if you look at their rankings, they're phenomenal. Did they put it all together on the court? No, they have a shitty head coach, and that's probably why. They have a great assistant coach, yeah. shitty head coach. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I mean rankings do matter at the end of the day, whether you want to believe it or not. Yeah, because if you look at, up and down their roster, they've got probably like nine top 100 kids from their respective classes. Like that means something because yeah. those guys, when – your starter goes down for three games. He might be inexperienced, but he is hell of talented. Like mm-hmm. Rutgers doesn't have that same luxury right now. Now, two years, I think that's a totally different story. When you know you have a guy like Delquan Warren, who's your seventh man, eighth man, and he's you know, I, I forget we said he'll be exactly, but he's probably going to be around seventy in the, in the latest rankings. Like, yeah, that is so much. That's much improved depth right there. Uh, than what Rutgers currently has. Okay, you're getting a number 20-something kid. 20 overall, I'm sorry. Number 20 overall and Gavin mm-hmm. Griffiths. Like, you're getting number 130 mm-hmm. or 140, whatever it was, and Bain Dangu. Like, it's kids. That's not even to mention if Derek continues to develop. Because to me, I mean, he had a great he had a great game yesterday. He had a very good game against Indiana. But outside of those two games, I mean, he hasn't had a really a great season. I mean, he's struggled he's flashes. with... Yeah, he's shown flashes, and I still, yeah. I still think he's a guy you know worth keeping around. I still think he's going to be a, hell, I still think he's going to be a hell of a player. But to me, is if I have to look, if I have to look at what's in front of me, I mean, he just hasn't had a great season. He's struggled bringing the ball up for m- most of the season, other than maybe yesterday. His shot hasn't been great this year. He's, I mean, just to me, it's it, it's a, it's been a, to me it's been a learning season. For yeah, him. and that's what's expected of a freshman, like yes. of, of his ranking too. Like that's you learn, you get better. And we're not being negative here. We're just being honest. Like, the recruiting ranking is pretty accurate. He's going to develop into a nice piece. You saw a glimpse of it. Yeah, you saw a big glimpse of it yesterday. We saw glimpses of it all season. And now he's probably going to keep getting more and more minutes, and he's just going to keep developing. Like, I, I I, just think it's an accurate ranking. That's all I'm trying to say. All right, let's, let's kind of continue on that path with recruiting and recruiting rankings. Rutgers had the, you know, top 50 kid on campus this past week um, in Kurtang. Uh, Richie, have you heard anything about how his visit went and how Rutgers is doing in his recruitment? Uh, yeah, I said this last pod. Everyone's going to stop with the, with the, they lost. Are you kidding me? He's going to be fucking miserable. Like, no, dude. Like, it's still a crazy atmosphere. And it was still a pretty damn good game, and it was close a little bit. Um, yeah, no, he still had a good time, a good visit. I actually had Rutgers in, as the leader going into the visit. I still have them as the leader. I, I really think that they're going to end up pulling this one out. Um and then everyone's going to ask the same question. All right, like, hey, he's a shooting guard. We got a point guard. Do, do we, are we going to get Dylan or is this a replacement for Dylan? No. This Dylan is – I don't know how to describe Dylan. He's like a two slash three, like, kind of. He's going to be like – he's probably going to take the ball up more than anyone. <laughs> like, he's gonna I think happy. we're going to have a lot of guys taking the ball up when the class of 24 gets here. Yeah, I, it's, I think it'll it's, be fairly flexible in terms of who can handle – what the ball who could like call an offense who can facilitate i think there's going to be a lot of guys who can do it which makes you so much more dangerous yeah it's it's going to be insane i know dylan's technically listed as a shooting guard but you can easily put delquan Kurtang, and dylan on the court at the same time and then yeah, i don't know maybe throw a guy like gavin griffiths and maybe a ace bailey out there just play small ball a little bit have five That's fucking wild. <laughs> holy crap five Four or five stars, like top forty recruits, top forty or better lineup. Like, holy shit! Like, oh god, it's gonna be crazy if it happens. But uh, yeah, no, it sounds like Kurt Tang is gonna decide. I don't know if it's either later this week or next week. He definitely wanted to go home, regroup. You don't want to just make a rash decision after a visit because you're always gonna have that like after visit high where you're always like, this, this was the greatest thing in the world. Like, this was awesome. Like that. That's it. I'm going there. You gotta sit back, talk to your family, be like, all right, sit and pick out all the options, put them down, pros cons. Now, some kids don't do that. Some kids are just like in love with the allure of a college visit. And they're like, oh, shit, I'm here. I'm, that's it. I'm done. And then yeah. they decommit a week later. Um, but this one, he wants to sit down, take his time. I know he wants to. He said he was deciding after the Rutgers visit, and that was it. So 
it's it's just a waiting game at this point. Um, could happen this week. Could happen next week. Could happen an hour from now, and we're probably going to be recording another pod. <laughs> but yep. Uh, yeah. No, it sounds like Rutgers is still in a very good spot there, and I, I'm I'm actually like eerily confident in this one. And that, and everyone, it's just crazy. Like no one's talking about it. He's a top forty recruit. Like it went from everyone. Oh, that, I would say nobody's not talking nobody's about talking it. about it, but it's just like. It's just crazy to see, like, everyone's like, Dylan, 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 Dylan. It's like, this kid's top 40, that kid's top 70, like, and there's just not as much hype as, like, the Dylan train. I get it. Dylan's phenomenal. He's fucking good. He's going to be four or five in our rank, or three or four in our rankings when it comes out next week. But, damn, like, give him a little hype here. Like, this kid's top 40. And it sounds like yep. he might get a little bump, too. Yeah, this so is stay wild. tuned to that, because <laughs> we could have uh, some good news coming in the next couple of weeks. Uh, let's pivot a little bit more. Let's talk football recruiting. There were some uh, Philadelphia area talk kids. That. Uh, let's talk. Let's, let's just... humor me here, kid. Uh, <laughs> so Rutgers was announced in the top three or top four for a couple high-level Philadelphia area kids recently. Mm-hmm. I know that there's some uh, junior days coming up. Uh, let's talk about the two kids who announced Rutgers in their top three or four. They're both Philly kids. Uh one sounds like it's pretty much wrapped up, but, but just uh, go into both of them. Yeah, so um, number one, the Kenneth Woosley, uh, he actually came on a visit. Uh, well, I said that wrong. I always say it wrong. Woosley, um, Imhotep, DB. He's probably like a slot corner, to be honest, in the future. He's only like 5'10", 5'11". But uh, no, he's, he's a good prospect. I think he's in the top 250, but it sounds like he's all Penn State all the way. Uh, he's announcing this Friday, uh, top four of Rutgers. Who was it, Dan? I forget. Rutgers, Penn State, State, Michigan, and Nebraska. Yeah. Uh, Nebraska's getting – Matt Rule has Philly connections, so he's he's going to be a pain in the ass. He's always going to be there for Philly kids. Um, and this one sounds like it's Penn State all the way. And, and you go to the other one, and Zafir, Zafir Stewart. Zafir Stewart? Zafir Stewart. Uh, massive offensive lineman. He's a guard at the next level probably. I think he's 6'4", 3-something. Uh, he has Penn State, Nebraska, and Rutgers in his top three. He's not a take for Penn State at the moment, I don't think. Um, so it's going to come down to Rutgers and Nebraska. He visited Rutgers in January, and he's planning on visiting Nebraska in March, this upcoming March, when the, the dead period ends, I think, this weekend, actually. Yeah, it ends this weekend. So kids are going to start getting to campus again. I know Rutgers is planning on having some visitors. Uh, but anyway, back to Stuart real quick. He's he's going to go to Nebraska, and then he's probably going to make a decision after that. Now, he's, he's a kid whose recruitment, I think, is still going to remain open no matter what. I think even if he commits to Rutgers or even if he commits to Nebraska, he's still going to have – Schools looking at him, keeping a close eye on him, and if if he develops the way that some people in uh, down in Philly expect him to develop, I wouldn't be surprised if he flipped like pretty late in the process, just because it it happens it happens every so often. Um, but yeah, Rutgers has a couple kids on campus this weekend that are intriguing. Um, Jack Hines, offensive lineman out of Avon Holt Old Farms, that prep school up in Connecticut, that I don't think Rutgers has really recruited since. Uh, he got Cassian Green from there. That's a oh, deep well, cut. That, that's the good one. He's an Elizabeth we're, kid, but yeah, we're, he yeah, we're not quick. we're not going to talk about uh, the one that got kicked off the team. Cassian oh, Green didn't get kicked off. The no, team. Kasim... no, the the DB from that kick. Uh, oh yes, 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 Andre uh, Dobbs, Hobbs. No, I don't know. He was a guy who had a lot of hype out of camp. It sounded yeah. like he was really good, and then. He yeah, was out of a, Avon, but the flood thing. Yeah, but, but they're back in the New England area again. Um, it seems like Rutgers are going to hit that area pretty hard too. Uh, they went at Ophiri last class. Jack Hines is coming. He, he's in oh, what is he listed? He's massive. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, six seven two eighty offensive line, offensive lineman. Um, sounds like Rutgers is in a really good spot there. This is going to be his first visit to campus. He's going to get to meet Pat Flaherty and Scott Valone, who's kind of sort of the lead recruiter for linemen. They're in a weird situation there where, like, Flaherty's – he's older. Like, it's pretty well known. Like, he, I don't think he wants to go on the road 24-7. But from yep. what I understand is that you can switch guys on and off the road. So I wouldn't be shocked if Valone's the guy that goes on the road for the most part in terms of linemen. Or you use that spot and use, like, uh, multiple guys because Charlie Noonan's making some connections up there as well. So it's like – you could just kind of like, hey, we're going to Long Island this week. All right, Valone, you're on the road. Hey, we're going to New England this week. Hey, Noonan, you're on the road. Or so, or I don't even know who else you could put on. Nas Jones is another guy who's who's a pretty good uh, recruiter that could be put on the road. Um, there, there's your uh, New Jersey connections there. But they're also hosting Benjamin Blackburn, a tight end out of Florida, who 
really intriguing to me, but you got to always be hesitant with these Florida kids because he's visited um, Florida State a couple times and don't think they've offered yet. They haven't offered yet, but they're really close to offering. So even if he does commit, I would just be super hesitant about that one. Um, I think he likes Rutgers a lot. He's very big on Rutgers. Andy Alrich is the lead guy here, and then this is going to be his first visit to campus. Now, Florida, he visited last month as well. So you just got to watch out for every single Florida school at this point. And uh, he visited UCF recently. They're a major factor, too. But uh, th- those are two big names. And then Braswell Thomas is the third one that we have confirmed so far. And he's the kid out of Lower Cape May Regional, who where <laughs> coaches never go to. But they, they've had four or five Power Five co- head coaches go there this uh, this past January. So, I mean, that's that says it all. That kid is good. I don't care what anyone says. And uh, I would just keep a close eye out on him, too. I, I, he's t- 2025. He's not going to commit anytime soon, but he's just it's a good prospect. So that's that's all I really got for now. I know uh, they have some more visitors coming the week after. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. A lot of visitors are coming April 1st as well. Um, it's kind of just going to be spaced out. Rutgers has the luxury, too having that late spring game. So it's going to be huge for them in terms of visitors because you can, while everyone is having their kids on campus this month for spring practices, Rutgers doesn't start till I think March 29th, 28th, whatever it is. Uh, so they're going to have the entire month of April while all these recruits have nowhere to go. Like they're not going to be able to see spring practices anywhere else because Rutgers spring game is so late, which it works to their, their advantage. So it's going to be interesting to see how, uh, who comes to campus and uh, kind of go from there. I'm sure there'll be plenty of new offers as well. Yeah, and plus it's, it's so great to have that back on Rutgers Day because that's such a, a good opportunity for kids to be on campus and see some some kind of buzz around because it's you know one of the first it's usually on the, one of the first nice weekends of the year and just to get kids on campus with a ton of you know passionate Rutgers fans and see what Rutgers can really bring to the table um, across the board. Yeah, uh, I did want to cover one more thing that we didn't touch on. It's uh, Rutgers bracketology outlook. Um, so I sent. Uh, resident uh, bracketology favorite, uh, Brad Wachtel. He's a Rutgers guy. He does facts and bracks. He's one of the smartest guys in the, the bracketology space. Um, I asked him kind of an update on Rutgers' outlook right now. So currently, Brad Wachtel has Rutgers as an eight seed in his projections, which, in my opinion, isn't ideal because that's, you know, facing a one seed in the second round. I threw a couple scenarios at him to see – what he thought Rutgers could become. First scenario I threw at him was Rutgers finishes 2-0 and the rest of the season. So they win at Minnesota, win at home versus Northwestern. They win their first game in the Big Ten tournament and get bounced in the second round or whatever their second game is. And then the other scenario I threw at him was uh, they win at Minnesota, they lose at home versus Northwestern, and then they don't win a game in the Big Ten tournament. So they go 1-2 and two versus 3-1 and one to finish the season. So he said in the first scenario, they're 7 or 8 seed. Um, second scenario, they're a nine or a 10 seed. So it doesn't look like they could do a whole lot to change their, their seating at the moment. Um, they seem to be pretty safely in the field. Rutgers currently is 32 in the net after last night's win, 31 in Ken Palm. They're, uh, 19th in ESPN's basketball power index. Um, so I think in order to really get themselves back out of this seven to 10 seed range, they probably have to win out. They probably have to win at least two games in the Big Ten tournament. But I think it's really important that Rutgers is a ten, is a seven seed uh, in terms of if they want to advance. Because I think if you play a team like Purdue in the second round versus a team like Alabama or Kansas, like that is so much different. That's a, a big teardrop in my opinion of how good these teams are. Um, I don't know. What do you What do you guys think? Uh, what would you see like the ideal scenario be for Rutgers in terms of seeding at this point? I don't, I don't know. I'm looking at bracket matrix right now and they track like all the big name bracketologists and the, number one, we're, we're going to throw some hate here. Eric Haslam of Haslam metrics is the, there's 89 brackets, mm-hmm. 88 of them Rutgers is in. And then there's six teams under them that all are in 89. Eric Haslam has a metric just doesn't have Rutgers in their bracket. That's like, insane. I don't, I don't understand why, like it makes no sense to me, but I, maybe he's a hater who knows, but uh West coast guy too. So it makes no sense really like at all. Yeah. But um, the highest I'm seeing their seed is a six seed by uh, Jamal Murphy of blackatology. 
And then uh, the lowest is 11 seed by a couple different people, which I, th I think that might just be, again, I think it's a lot of hating. And um, this is all from 226. So this is from yesterday. So, I mean, could I'm uh, hoping it's probably before the game happened. So go based on that. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what the best case scenario is. Like, either way, like, based on the seeds that they're getting projected, you're probably playing a one or two seed in the second round. And that's, yeah, I'd rather be an 11 seed than be an 8 seed, honestly. Just for yeah. – as long as you're not that's playing a Dayton, I'd rather be an 11 seed. Yeah, it's, it's I tough. Say that, yeah. I, don't, I don't really know. Craig, what do you think? I don't know. I don't, For some reason, it keeps ringing in my mind. I have a feeling you beat I, – I, maybe you beat Minnesota, you lose the next two. And I don't know. I feel like they could be a 7 seed, honestly. Because if you look at their resume, their resume is still pretty good. And, like, again, the bubble this year is just pretty brutal. So to me, I don't know why. Like maybe an eight seed makes more sense, but if you be, I don't know. For some reason, the seven seed keeps kind of ringing in my mind, and I could see them giving Rutgers maybe a, a little bit of a uh, of a you know thing there. Where I don't know. That's just, it's just that's just my opinion. It's just that's just kind of how I see it. I'm, I'm I'm not a bracketologist, so I don't know. But for some reason, that keeps sticking out to me. How do you become a bracketologist? You just start putting numbers together for fun, and it's like, <laughs> hey, I'm a mathematician, but on the side. I'm a bracketologist. <laughs> so, you, you guys know what search engine optimization is, SEO, right? Yeah. yeah. I see bracketology as sort of like somebody who understands SEO. It's mm. not like you're necessarily like some guru savant, like who figured it all out. It's just you've kind of tracked what the NCAA has said in terms of what they look for, and then you've historically looked at what they've done, and then you've kind of like plotted that out and made your own <laughs> matrix or made your own algorithm, made your own system to, to project mm. it. Obviously, it takes smart people to do that, but at the same time, you're just basically going off of historical data, like what what is like shown to be important in the past and what is shown to be important this year. Um, so, typically, it's like how many quad one wins do you have and how many low, like quad three, quad four losses do you have, and those are big determinants. Like Rutgers was a huge outlier last year because they had so many quad three or quad four losses, but also so many quad one and two wins. So. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have the patience to go back and look at this or even the time to even put towards this. But you think people just like you just go through all the automatic qualifying conferences, just pick the top seed in each and then just fill the mm -hmm. rest in based on net rankings. And that's it. <laughs> like, yeah, it's basically right? it's like, a safe way to do it. Honestly. Yeah. I don't think anyone's going to no one's going to fact check you because no one has the time to fucking go back and be like, man, this guy actually has number 56 in the net. Like, perfect. Like, wow. Holy shit. Like, no. Like, mm -hmm. There's a part of me that's just like, there's also a part of me that's just like, just put them, please just put them in Albany or like DC. Please don't put them in the. I'm in Birmingham right now, it looks like. Yeah. That's oh. a rough one. As long as they're in the East Regional, man. Keep the yeah. MSG dreams alive. Well, that that was the Midwest, so Kansas City. <laughs> Hear me out. It's, it's mm, probably yeah, a pretty fun, probably a pretty okay. fun trip. Like, go, well, catch an, okay. go catch the worst team in the NBA. <laughs> Kansas City? Okay. Right, okay, see. That's, they're not close, man. Oh, oh my God, jeez. Oh, I, I hear KC and K. No, dude, I'm. It's too early. I'm done. Count me out. <laughs> Shut the pot off. All right. On that note, is there anything that we we haven't touched on that anybody wanted to hit before we sign off here? <sighs> Baseball's got to pick it up, man. But shout out to softball. Softball is fucking dominating right now. Um, Same thing for lacrosse, man. Big shout yeah. out to men's lacrosse. They beat. Uh, Loyola of Maryland pretty handily. I think Loyola of Maryland was ranked in the top 10. I think they were sixth, if I'm not mistaken. The uh, snapped defending champion Maryland's win streak at, I think, like 20-something. Um, huge win for them after the, the, the close loss to at Army. Um, so big shout-out to the, the men's lacrosse team. Yeah, it's a five-hour drive from KC to Oklahoma State. Oklahoma City. Well, that's yeah. it's a rough look. It's, <laughs> it's, rough. it's sneaky out there. We're we're just so used to this convenience of the Northeast, where it's like, I live, you know, in northern New Jersey. How long did it take possibly to get to Philly? Oh, an hour. An no, hour. An hour. hour. Yeah. How long does it take to get to Baltimore? How long does it take to DC? Everything's like within like a four-hour right range from, from yeah. DC to to Boston. It's so convenient, uh, but not Again, elsewhere. Please, please just put them in Albany or DC, please. You don't want to go to. Uh... I don't even know how to say it. Des Moines, Iowa? Des Moines. Des Moines. Uh, I think I'm, I'm good. good on that. I'm good. Uh, I mean, there's not some, there's some bad, decent options like Orlando. I mean, we got to go to Orlando for a couple of okay, days. That. Oh, no. <laughs> Stop yeah. me. 
Yeah, that okay. I'll give you that one. Greensboro, um, not too bad. Drivable, just not yeah, ideal. Um, Columbus, eh. Denver, eh. Weed is legal. Weed's legal yeah, here. Weed's legal in New Jersey, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Wake up and smell the uh, the buds. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, dude, it's rough. Like sometimes dude, this apartment living, I, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus on the pod, but like there's <laughs> a guy next to me, man. It just reeks all the time in the hallway. And I'm like, dude, just spray or something. Like spray some Febreze, please. Like, That's the weirdest part is that given there are so many options now for your, your cannabis uh, consumption, whether that be mm-hmm. edibles, whether that be, you know, vape pens, a lot of people still choose to, to do it the old school way. And it's obviously the, the least sneaky way too. Uh, I'm not hating on it. I just think. I, mean, <laughs> I prefer the edibles, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> all right, all right. That would be a fun pod. <laughs> uh, well, we could try. We got to get more subscribers. Yeah, we got to. We got to get. We got to get you drinking that uh, that Eric Legrand whiskey. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, uh, we'll, we got to. Do- we'll, we'll drew a drink. Uh, you know. Hey, we we got to try another live pod too. Whether it be via our yeah. own homes, even though it's kind of weird if we're all drinking separately or smoking weed separately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could try and do something for Selection Sunday. I know that uh, the Night Society was talking about doing another event for that, so maybe that'll be what we end up doing, but uh, yeah, we'll I'm open to it for sure. Yeah, but I think that's all we really got. It's been a long one. Let's yeah, so... go Knicks. Let's oh, go shut it off. Who, shut who it off. Go oh, Knicks. Knicks. Who cares? Oh, Most and Rangers. Dude, and you're, Rangers. Not even a, you're not even a five seed right now? Wow. Oof. We'll get there. Where are you right now? <laughs> five. Or six? What were oh. we six? I think we were six. You guys, we're gonna, the, the you Nets know we're five seed, the Knicks are the six seed. Who cares? Again, who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Let's we're go. Right. Another <laughs> edition of the Night Report podcast. Signing off. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye. Five star review.